So we should all be back together here. Uh, Psalm 85 is where we're going to go. Psalm 85, beginning around verse number 10. So let's turn, if we would, to our Bibles there. And I'm going to ask Tar if she would, if she would read that verse for us as we go into our study time together this afternoon. Yes. It says, Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Let's, amen. Let's pray. Father, we want to pray today that as we spend our time together and as we explore your word, that you would speak to our hearts and that you would help us to feel, to, to sense the closeness that you have to us, even in the form of a kiss where together um, you create and recreate us um, in you. So please bless our time in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Psalm 85 um, takes us from where we left off in Psalm 27. Mm -hmm. It was the experience that David was having and where he practically followed this path in the midst of trouble where he looked at his situation and he found that, you know what, the way out of this in Psalm 27 is first thing first, I got to have faith over fear. I got to speaking. When you read in the book of Revelation, let's go to turn to Revelation chapter 14 and Revelation chapter 14. This is a path or uh, the way for we are doing as the overcomers and the way that we find our way forward in Revelation chapter 14, beginning there around verse number 12. Where after three angels message has gone out, these are they, these are the overcomers. Here's the patience of the saints. What's their patience? Here are they that keep, keep the, commandments the commandments of God and, and the, the faith, faith of, of Jesus. Jesus. So you see that what he overcame and went through in the same experience. Now we have a path to victory and our path to victory is to keep the commandments of God and to trust Jesus. So now if you were to take those, if we already have and, and kind of look at them in tandem or in partnership, right. The aspect of keeping the commandments, then the aspect of faith in Jesus. Going back to what we read here in Psalm 85, what does it say or what are the two elements that the psalmist says have kissed or that have come together? It says what? The righteousness and peace. Righteousness and peace, or rather mercy righteousness and, and mercy, mercy and truth, and truth have kissed. Right. So now, if these two things have kissed, and then in Revelation 14 it says, so they keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. Is there a relationship mm -hmm. between the two? Is there a relationship between the two to where right here, right now, what the Lord is wanting us to experience is mercy and truth coming together, righteousness and peace coming together, mm -hmm. not one and the other, right. but coming together, even in the form of a kiss. I guess what we're trying to get you to understand today is that the, the saints, the overcomers in Revelation 14 have received and accepted the kiss of God's mercy and God's truth. God's righteousness and God's peace have come together now. Then that that kiss, that embrace, that connection is undeniable. They can't refute it. They can't and they don't want to get out of it. And they are patient and they are trusting in that kiss. And I think it's important to recognize the fact that in this revelation comparison, it's when we have seen them come together. Mm -hmm. Because in Christ, in the Father, they're always together. Mm -hmm. They exist automatically, simultaneously. Right. Right. But in our eyes, we have finally seen them coming together. We no longer see his mercy separated from his truth. But when we are able to see his extreme mercy combined with his authentic truth, mm -hmm. then we can really pick up the mantle and do what he says do with all the faith of Jesus. So there are a lot of people, basically what you're saying then mm -hmm. is that, and I shouldn't say a lot of people, I know even I find myself guilty of this. Right. We've separated. Yeah, we do that. We've separated the two to where we see God as um, either he's all, all about the law, all truth, you know, period, or 
he just, oh, uh, you know, just whatever, you know, I love, you know, mercy, 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 mercy. Um, we don't, we don't, and so because of that, we don't see the love in the law, <laughs> and, and we don't see the the truth of mercy. Yeah, we sometimes think that when we're experiencing God's mercy, that somehow He puts His truth to the side, He puts mm. His truth to the back, and it's really not important anymore because He's extending His mercy towards us. And mm. sometimes when we are seeing His truth come forward, and it's a truth that's convicting us of the things that we have to uh, allow to be changed in our lives, we can't see his mercy anywhere. Mm. So it's almost, it takes uh, a, a great work for our eyes to pick up, our hearts to pick up how these two things, these two characteristics of God work together. There's never one absent of the other. Mm. They're always working together, but we don't always see how they work together. And that's, that's, I hope we caught that last word you just said. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Right. We've separated the two. We can be blind or ignorant to them being one. But as far as who God is, that is who he is, which is why I believe the Lord has put this burden on our heart mm -hmm. that right now what he wants us to really focus on in our study is how he is mercy and truth. How he is righteousness and peace as one. We want to see him not as we want him to be, but we really want to see him for as he is, for who he is. And, you know, another thing, too, sometimes when we when 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 the father comes to us privately, personally, mm -hmm. and he calls us to come up righteously, he mm -hmm. calls us to come up in the way that we're living in. He's asking us to connect with him so that his righteousness can be seen more clearly in our lives, we sometimes don't have peace with that. Mm. You know, that peace and that mm. righteousness, they're right. not kissing each other. Mm. They are separated. And sometimes we can't find that peace that comes with believing that he can put this in our lives. He can put right. this in our hearts and we can go forward with peace. But sometimes it disrupts us because a lot of times we're fighting it. Mm, we're mm. fighting whether or not that's a reality, whether or not we're really struggling with pride, whether right. or not we're really struggling with being honest, mm. whether or not we're really struggling with whatever God comes to us on. Mm. We're struggling with it. So there's no peace. And we think we start to see God as this one that calls us to do something that either is false or that's impossible. So that's deep because a lot of some people, they tend to call that conservative Christianity or fundamental Christianity or even present truth Christianity to where it's all about the right and the rightness or the righteousness doing the right thing. And it's amazing how you can find people doing the right thing, but they're so unhappy or they're so bitter or they're so angry. And you say, well, how is it? And they're doing the right thing is because it's they've separated the two. It's righteousness without peace. Mm -hmm. It's it's truth without mercy. So on the one hand, you have that extreme of that ultra conservative. But then you have on the other hand, the ultra liberal where, you know, anything goes because God is so merciful. But then you have with that looseness, all kinds of junk and stuff and and behind the scenes and down low stuff going on. But it's being excused because of. Just this mercy. And I think Christ, when he was speaking while here on earth, he made the comment. He says, some of you are blind, mm -hmm. but you think you see. Yeah. But I've come to cause the blind to see. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we have peace in our lives because we've just settled into the fact that my righteousness is good it's enough. Because good enough, it's, it's better than theirs. Right. And we just have to be very careful when it comes to righteousness and peace being because we have connected with the one mm -hmm. that perfectly embodies righteousness and peace. We've yeah. connected with him and our peace comes from the righteousness of Christ that is within us. So as we've tried to illustrate, even with the shirts to where love is a reality, but there's this dual aspect that we've got to understand in scripture to where God is truth, but he is also mercy. And if you and take together, and together, you create love, but apart, you only have a peace. And what we want you to really ask yourself today is we go deeper in our study here in second Kings chapter six mm -hmm. to illustrate 
God's mercy and truth working for his people. Are you on, do you only have one shirt? Are, are you only in one half to where it's just all mercy, but no truth or all truth, but no mercy. It's literally like being kissed by one lip. And how much sense would that make? How romantic would that be? And, but most people, even Christians are being kissed with one lip. God wants to kiss it with both lips, mercy and truth, righteousness and peace. Let's go to an example of him bringing these together in the book of second Kings. Second Kings chapter six is where we're going to go. So if you have your Bible, you can turn there. You see how old school is even quicker. See, Tara's already there and, and she's old school with the Bible. And I'm going to try and go new school here, but she's already turned there. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> amen, amen. So make sure you have your Bibles open. Second Kings chapter six. And this is an important story. We're going to read through it. We're going to get there. So let's go to Second Kings chapter 6, and I'm going to ask her, if you would please, read us on through, and we'll start uh, probably around verse 8 or so. Okay. Here we have, and the sons of the prophet said unto Elijah, Elisha, behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, go ye. And one said, be content, I pray thee, and I go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one who was failing, uh, failing a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. That's just one story of one of the miracles that God performed in Elisha's life. Exactly. In the, in the presence of the ones who were in the school of the prophets. So now we're, we're getting to the story to the point where, you see who our main character is. This is Elisha. This was the successor to Elijah. Right. And so still Israel is functioning primarily through a prophet and a king, but the prophet really being the voice of the presence of God, the, right. the one who speaks to his people. So now Elisha is speaking here to the kingdom of Israel. And in particular, they're building a school of the prophets. And this is a miracle you may or may not have heard of where he causes an ax head to float in the water to find it. So while they're in the process of doing God's will and this accident happens, the divinity comes in and, and makes a difference. <laughs> now, while all this amazing stuff is going on, there are still enemies to the people of God. Yes. There are still enemies to the faith of God in spite of the miracles of God. So that's what we pick up the story now. We're going to read here, beginning here in verse number eight. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of and saved himself there. Not once nor twice. OK. All right. So let's let's stop here for a second and do a, a quick a quick advertisement for what we were talking about this morning in the Sabbath school lesson. Mm -hmm. You may recall that in the Sabbath school lesson, we were talking about scripture, sola scriptura and specifically uh, specifically. I about to say particularly and specifically together. <laughs> specifically, we looked at Thursday's lesson. We talked about the Bible and Ellen G. White. We talked about the prophetic ministry. Here's an example of the prophetic gift and its forth telling, dealing with the present and God giving a word, a right now word. Literally, Elisha was being told where to tell the king to not go to avoid the attacks and the ambushes of the Syrians. Told by the father. Told, and, 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 and it was told, and then he would tell the king, and then they were just getting this protection because they had this divine access and resource. Mm -hmm. This is, again, the ministry of a prophet to guide and to direct our paths mm -hmm. in addition to the inspiration of the word. Now, as this was happening and going on, the king of Syria was not happy about it. 
And what you got to understand is when the Lord starts speaking to us, when the Lord starts speaking to you and directing your paths, that does not move the enemy to step back. In fact, it's going to move him to get even more in your face, even more in your house, even more in your life to get or break up that transmission. But look at what God is able to do. And still remember, our main focus is mercy and truth. But look at as we're building up here, what his response is, the king's response here in verse 11. Let's start there in verse 11. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel. Telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Keep reading. Yeah, one more verse. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city about. All right. So now here we are in the in this story to where the, the secret sauce is no longer secret. They know where they're getting their information mm -hmm. and they're getting their information from the prophet. And so now in his mind and in their flesh and at the behest of the enemy, Satan, they go and attempt to ambush and assassinate the prophet, mm -hmm. cut off the line of communication and by cutting off that line of communication, you destroy the information, you destroy the access, you destroy the life and the protection that they've had. And this is not the first time we've seen something like this in the Bible. Mm. This is the same scenario with Daniel. Yeah. So when Daniel kept coming out on top, Daniel kept coming to the rescue. They were trying to figure out what is the secret? Mm. What is the secret? How is it that no matter how we try, no matter how devious we get, no matter how many tricks and pranks or whatever we try and do, we can never go can't and be better yeah. than Daniel or catch him in the wrong. Yeah. And when they finally saw the source, mm. which was his prayer life, which was his dependence on God. And this is Daniel was found with an excellent spirit. That was the source. And mm. that is what the enemy tried to get to. So mm. once the source was identified, then the source will be attacked. So well, could it be then for us mm -hmm. who are trying to turn to the word of God, those of us who are trying to walk to the testimonies, that'll be the very thing that he'll try to attack or get us to maybe start doubting mm -hmm. or just, well, I don't need it as much anymore. Or just he'll try to attack that in some way. Well, think about this in today, like right now, what we're going through mm -hmm. with the whole Corona, social distancing, everybody being asked to stay at home. Well, now... We have these phases being rolled out, phase one, phase two, phase three. And so people are starting to get back into uh, a, a, a more familiar way of living. Mm -hmm. Well, for those who have grown spiritually during this time of isolation, mm -hmm. those who have found more time to study God's word, to th reflect on the changes that need to be now, made in their lives. Now, distractions coming back. That we have to make sure mm -hmm. that we are asking the Lord to keep us on that path because mm. you you definitely know yes. that the enemy is going to go after the source. Mm. He's going to go after what is the source of this change that's happening in your life? What is the source of you becoming stronger mm. and you becoming more aware of how to live and how to have faith and not worrying and not being afraid? Mm. Those are the things that will be attacked if that is truly being strengthened in our lives. But as we will see, we have a protector of those things. So when those things are attacked and the enemy is trying to attack our connection and our faith, let's see how mercy and truth come to the rescue. In other words, how God would be normally out with God or how Jesus. Let's see how he plays that out in his deliverance of Elisha and his servant. So we're going to pick it up now in verse 15. When the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city both with horses and chariots and his servant said unto him alas my master how shall we do and this is elisha's servant mm. and he answered 
Fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Mm. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes, my servant's eyes, that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. All right. Okay. So now here it is. This this is this is the scene now. This thing is about to go down, and they're seeing what not what God's about to do necessarily, but they're seeing something's about to happen. His eyes are open. Yeah. And so it's amazing not because everybody could see you when God. I know, him. right? It's like his eyes are open. His eyes are open, just like we were saying. We our prayer is that we want our eyes to be open to who God really is. Right. See, the servant did he did not not know God. Mm -hmm. He wasn't. I mean, he was Elisha's servant. He was like the right hand man to the prophet. He knew about God. He knew about all he had done. He just remember we just read how he did the miracle of the accent and how even when we read before how the Lord had already been on multiple occasions giving Elisha the scoop. He knew God. But even in this instance, it showed he didn't know all of him. Right. His eyes weren't completely open. That's why this is so important. Even if you're a, you're a died in the wool, fourth or third generation Christian or whatever church you go to, you can still not know all of him. Yeah. You can still not see all of him. That's why the prayer is, Lord, open our eyes. So we can see with new eyes who you really are. In your completeness. And let's not forget the people that the Lord chooses to send into our lives mm. to help us see, to see, to pray for us, mm. to guide us through. When we are on this journey spiritually with him, he will put people in our path to encourage us. Wow. We're so angry or we're so worried or we're so afraid. And He then he will send someone in with a mm. text or a phone call mm. and remind us, mm. don't forget who God is. Yeah. Don't forget what he can do right. or send you a verse or send a message your way just so that your eyes can be seen just so your eyes can see exactly what god wants you to see so what does the lord do he's opened his eyes now because fear he's, was he's, taken over oh because elisha said yeah. fear not fear he not saw the fear yeah he had he saw the fear but he had reason to be afraid yeah, i mean he was being surrounded by horses chariots and a great host and there was no way out there i mean they couldn't fly there was nowhere for them to fly. That was it as far as what he saw. But what he did not see is that God was there. Now, what and how does God move? Yes. That's where we want to go now and look at verse number 17. Who prays and what happens? Well, and Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. Now, remember, what is our main focus and what's our point? The central point today is the kiss. The kiss of Psalm 85, which is mercy and truth, righteousness and peace. What or what was the reason that these guys came to visit Elijah, Elisha? Did they, did they come for a Bible study? No. Did they come so they, they were trying to participate in um, feeding the homeless ministry and they were there to try and help out to move. By? No, they what did they come there to do? They came there to capture, to take they Elisha came, yes. so that. They can do what they are trying to do. And they were going, Elisha was interfering. Yeah, they were there to kill them. They, they were there to break one of God's commandments. In fact, I think that's the sixth commandment to not kill. So they were not there for a good reason. They were not there for a good thing. They were wrong. Yeah. And God's answer, God's response to all wrong is truth. Mm -hmm. God's response, the law's response to all sin is death. That's the truth. And we've got to understand that in this scenario, the Lord is just in putting a check on their wrong. And he checks it. 
He stops him. He does not allow that to continue. And so this is truth being manifested because the Bible says Elisha prayed and he prayed and said, Lord, smite them with blindness. Because verse 18 says, mm -hmm. I'm pointing to it and I don't even have it up. Verse 18 says, according to the word of Elisha, he said, now smite them with blindness. I'm up in verse 18. The Syrians who are coming down now. Yes. And the so the Syrians don't see what the servant is able to see and what Elisha is able to see. They, they don't, right. They're there to attack. They're there to do the job that they came there to do. And boom, right. they fall into judgment. Mm -hmm. They are stricken with the blindness. They can no longer see. This is God's truth. This is God's justice. This is where we have to recognize when there is wrong, there will be justice. Justice is there. But remember, it's a kiss and it is God's approach to us in not just in truth, but in what? Truth and in mercy, not just in righteousness, but also in peace. So that means that, OK, if you mean he's about to kiss the Syrians, just like he kissed Elisha and his servant with protection. Yes. Because <laughs> on the one hand, he's giving them judgment. They're blind now. But let's see if there's mercy. Can you read verse 19? Sure. And Elisha said unto them, he said unto the Syrians, as they are now blind, mm. Elisha goes to them with no fear, faith over fear. He says to them, this is not the way, neither is this the city. Mm. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria, away from Dothan, away from him, away from his servant but, and into another place. Well, that's his place. Samaria is his country. Mm -hmm. They were Syrians. So he was saying, no, this is not where you're supposed to be. I'll take you to Elisha. Mm -hmm. And he led them from the edges to the heart of Israel. He led them to Samaria, even, even to the presence of the king. Yeah. The king of Israel. The king of Israel. Mm -hmm. So now it comes to pass when they were coming to Elisha, to Samaria, that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men now. Yeah. That they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. Mm -hmm. Now we're transitioning from justice to mercy. Mm -hmm. We're going from righteousness to peace. Does Elisha show this peace? Is this the kiss? Well, the king says what in verse 21? And the king of Israel said unto Elisha, when he saw them, my father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? He repeats. Why were they, well, why were they there? <laughs> these weren't, these weren't, you know, the sunshine band. These were soldiers trained and committed to army. kill a whole contingent. Mm -hmm. So the king of Israel is like, this is a blessing. This is great. This is this is an answer to prayer, right? He's delivered my enemy. Their head is on the chopping block. He's got the axe ray saying, do I bring it down? Shall I smite them? What is Elisha's response? Know now and look at verse 22. And he answered, thou shall not smite them. Wouldest thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive with thy sword and with thy bow? Wow, wow. Would, would you smite those whom you've taken captive with your sword and your bow? In other words, it's almost like he's not he's not he's not calling out the Geneva Convention. You know, how we have the G Geneva Convention of warfare, how we are not and how we're supposed to treat political prisoners or or prisoners of war. He says, if you had them and, and they were at your mercy and, and you they were within your power, would you use that power to kill them? This was not, this was Israel. This right. was Israel, but, not the Assyrians or right, we any got, other heathen nation. This right. was God. Right, this is God's people. And so really it's like asking, you're a Christian. And when the Lord puts your enemy, when the Lord puts your mm -hmm. oppressors in a point where now you could do whatever you want to do with them, what will you do with them? This is the question he asks him, but it's the question that we got to ask ourselves. Yeah. Now that we've gotten them right where we want them, what are you going to do with them? And really, we can answer that by saying, what should we do with them? What should we do with someone? We have them right where they belong, right where they deserve to be. Look at what he says. He says, set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. 
You know, that's what Jesus told us to do. Mercy. That's what Jesus taught us. Mm. When you have, even if your enemy comes before you hungry, you are to feed them mm. and make them full and mm. bless them mm. and send them on our way. This is not natural. This is supernatural. Mm. This is not something we do automatically. That's why the king immediately he was thinking, destroy them. Yeah. Because this is not something we naturally do. Right. But when the we're spirit. dealing with the creator, when, when God has kissed us father, and yes. we're dealing with other people now that now we actually start people talking about, you know, having the character of Christ. We think that the character of Christ is just I'm not doing wrong. Like I'm not I don't sin anymore. I don't do that. sin. I don't. That's part of it. It's not just about what we don't do, though. It's about what do we do? And with the character of Christ, Elisha now, Old Testament, Elisha showing the gospel. Set bread and water before them. Okay, question: Bread and water are those wants or needs? Okay, those are those are non-negotiables. If you don't eat and if you don't drink, you will what? Yeah. Die. So could it be then that the reason why our enemies act the way that they do is because there's there's a need that's been missed? Oh yes. There's something that they have needed along the way, and because they've gone without it, that's why they are where they are. That's why they act the way they act. So. The gospel is not saying to to couch up or to prop up sin mm -hmm. or just kind of look the other way or wink it wrong. But it's saying focus on what the need is. This person needs. And because of it, your job as a Christian is to give them what they need, even not because they deserve right. it, but it's because it's what they needed. Well, and with the Sabbath School Youth Group, we've been talking about this whole quarter is based off of unrequited love. Mm. And so unrequited love, the whole basis or gist of it is love that's not reciproca reciprocated. Mm. So it's love that you give and you give it because this is what God commands you to give. Give love not to receive it in return. Because even Jesus said, well, what is this love that you give to those who love you back? Mm. But it's a greater love when we love those who don't love us back or mm -hmm. who has done so much against us to where we feel they don't deserve our love. Well, unrequited love is what God is asking us to have even for our enemies. Mm -hmm. And for anyone, we don't have to get in return what God access to give. Mm. This this is something that um, I remember last night we were reading Jeremiah. Um, uh, go to Jeremiah chapter six and the, the idea of ministry uh, and a ministry falling short of meeting people's needs. And um, in Jeremiah chapter six in verse number 13 is where we're going. Um, but this is a powerful idea how we can we can kind of have a good idea, a good start, but not go all the way uh, when it comes to the kiss and then extending that kiss to others. In Jeremiah chapter six, it speaks about the, the place of Israel. They're kind of in this, you know, again, half stepping, doing or saying the right thing, but they're not really doing the right thing. And so look at what it reads here in Jeremiah chapter six, verse number 11. It says, therefore. I am full of fury of the Lord. I'm weary of withholding it in. I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of the young men together. For even the husband and the wife shall be taken. The aged with him that is full of days. Their houses shall be turned to others with their fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land of the Lord. Now, what would get the Lord so upset? Like, OK, what is this? What happened that got him this worked up? Look at verse 13. From the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. That's one thing. And from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. That's another thing. But look, because of that, because of covetousness and because of a ministry that is misplaced and misdirected, look at what has happened to the people. Look what happens. From the least of them, rather, it says, they have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly. Okay. Saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. And for the longest time, yeah. I always looked at the, the, the last part of that verse where it says, they cry peace when there is no peace. 
meaning that they are not recognizing a situation and dealing with the reality of that situation. Mm -hmm. And the reality is they have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly. In other words, we got to recognize today that when we're talking about the kiss, when we're talking about ministry, when we're talking about reaching people and understanding how to reach them. We got to see that so much of what is happening is the fruit of hurt. And we've got to stop dealing with hurt slightly. Mm -hmm. And by dealing with it slightly, meaning I love you if you love me, but if you're mean to me, I'm going to give it back to you. Mm -hmm. And there's so much drama, especially in the church, where people are mistreating other people, but then being nice people outside the church or being nice people uh, on the street. Mm -hmm. But in the church, there's backbiting. There's all this scheming. There's all of this this meanness and, and hatred, which is just really a trickle down from the, the vice and the iniquity that actually is in our hearts. We got to do better because this is what got God to the point of saying, I'm mad with you. I'm mad with your old people. I'm mad with your husbands. I'm mad with your wives mm -hmm. because you all are dealing with hurt slightly. Yeah. I believe the Lord has called us to share this word today so we could stop dealing with hurt slightly mm -hmm. and get back to understanding that we have got to have the kiss. And see God for as he is, not for as we want him to be. And I think we can only see God as a kiss of mercy and truth and righteousness and peace. Only when we're willing to accept that reality in our own lives. Amen. We yeah, that's want to home. see that's that mercy and truth together in our lives. We want it towards us. We want that righteousness and peace to kiss mm -hmm. and for us. But are we willing to be a vessel? Are we willing to be a channel of that mercy and truth being realized as we are treating other people the way God wants us to treat them? Mm -hmm. So is righteousness and peace being demonstrated by the way we treat each other? Is mercy and truth being demonstrated by the way we treat each other? There's one key element to that. Mm. If we struggle with this, this is what I tell little ones, kindergartners, first graders, second graders. If you want to treat your enemy the way Jesus tells us to treat our enemies, just look at how we've treated Jesus. Just look at all of the faults that we have against our own creator. And when we think about his mercy towards us, when we think about all of the truth that we've neglected or refused to accept in our own lives, hmm. it helps us to see our enemies in a much different light. We, we, we can't keep going on holding on to something about someone else when we can clearly see what we've done against our father of love, true love. He is love. Mm -hmm. He gives us nothing but love, but yet we have hurt him. And he in return <laughs> has given us a perfect combination of righteousness and peace in our lives. Mm. I think the perhaps the best way to bring this thing home is when you read how the servant Elisha responded it's there in 2 Kings chapter 6. After they ate and after they drank, look at what happens here as we close in verse number 23. Can you read that for us, please? And he prepared great provision. This is the king of Israel. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away. And they went to their master. And what happened? Because of the choice to kiss with mercy and truth. Didn't let them invade. That was the truth. But now in mercy to feed them and to water them. What happened to that relationship? So, so the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. There it is. So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. That little clause there. So that's small. The bands of Syria no more came into the land of Israel. That was the fruit of the decision all up here. That was the impact that making the decision to kiss others 
as Christ has kissed us, it revolutionized and changed their relationship to the Syrians, and they no more invaded them. They kept being Syria. They did not wholesale repent and become believers of God, but they stopped invading Israel. And so could it be that the way forward in our relationships is rather than trying to change someone else, how about we just love them? And in loving them, that will change them. And the blueprint or the reason why we would do that is because of how God has kissed us, how he has not treated us consistent with how we have treated him. He's actually responded to our sin with salvation. He's responded to our faithlessness with faithfulness. And so if the Lord has done that for us, now it's our turn to do it for someone else. Any closing thoughts or closing words that you want to share as we prepare to pray to appeal that we would have this kind of experience. We live like Christians who've been kissed. Well, I hope that this will allow us to close, but I had a thought when you were talking mm, yeah. that I think a lot of people, I've met a lot of hurt people. A lot of people have been hurt by others and they're in that, that those trenches of deciding whether or not I'm going to forgive or whether or not I'm going to let it go or whether or not I'm going to love them, love them no matter how they have treated me. Mm. And I think one way we get out of those trenches and make a decision that we're willing to stand on firmly is that when we choose to forgive, when we choose to love and give a love that may not be uh, given back, that it may not change that person. Every story doesn't end with, they never bother you again, mm -hmm. or they never say anything to hurt you again, or they never do anything to hurt you again. Every story does not end that way. God is not holding us accountable for those kinds of things. He's holding us accountable for his love to be given without any expectation of things in return. So the good news, even in light of that reality, is it may not change them. Change. But it will change you. Yes, it will. It will. Because it takes an opening of our eyes to see, to get it. The light bulb going off as the servant was able to see all of the power that was working on his behalf. It takes our eyes opening to see all of the power working on our behalf to stand and forgive, to go forward with love to speak with mercy, to speak with peace and righteousness and truth, and to move forward, not focusing on the response, not focusing on whether or not it's going to be given back to me, which is doing it because I can see the power that is with me to be able to move forward with this in my heart. I think this, this is, this is, I believe this is where the Lord wants us to ask him mm -hmm. to do something. And we, when we say ask him to do something, this is our prayer and our appeal to him. Now that he's spoken to us, go and if you have your Bible, go to 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 17. Here is our prayer in light of what we have read beginning there in Psalm 85, how the kiss of, of Christ, how we can see this kiss of love, of mercy and truth, righteousness and peace. Our prayer now is that our eyes would be open. Our eyes would be open to see the host around us, that we would see God, not as we think that he is, not as we, even we may know him to be in the past. But now, really, Lord, open our eyes to see you yeah. as you actually are. And that's what he said here in verse 17. He prayed here and we invite us all to pray and read this together as as a as an appeal and as a prayer. Verse 17, Elisha prayed just like we're praying now and saying, Lord, I pray thee. Open his eyes that he may see. And we're praying, Lord, open our eyes yes. so that we can see. And we pray this mm -hmm. prayer. The promise is that the Lord will open the eyes of the young man, the young woman, the old man, the old women, all of us. And we will see. We will see and behold the mountain is full of horses and full of chariots of fire around about not just Elisha. But round about us. And let's pray for that to be. <laughs> Father, we thank you so much. And we thank you for giving us the opportunity 
to ask you to do what you've already done. You did it for Elisha and you did it for his servant. You even did it for these wicked Syrian soldiers and you did it for Israel to see. So there's no reason for us to doubt that you won't do it for us right now, that you would open our eyes to see you as you really are in your completeness, in your wholeness. You're not just truth and you're not just mercy, but together you are mercy and truth. You are righteousness and peace. And Lord, I pray that you would heal us from this one sided experience that we might be having. And that you would give us a wholeness. You would give us a, a, a vision that shows everything that you are and not just what we want to see. And, and definitely not just what the enemy is blinding us to see. Well, that's my prayer. And I pray as Tara finishes our prayer that that will be one thing that you do for us today. Lord, as we move forward from this moment into the remainder of our Sabbath, into the remainder of this day, and into a new week, Lord, may we see things differently. May we look at others differently. When people cross our path, even those who we may not know, and they're doing things, Lord, that we know that you're not pleased with, Lord, may we feel a deep impression to pray for them. May we feel a need and a desire to approach them if it is possible and share a word of encouragement or goodness towards them, Lord. Help us to step outside of our own selves and how we feel and what we want mm. and help us to look at the needs of others. Yes. Help us to see that there's a lot of hurt in our world, even amongst those who we know and love. Help us, Lord, to be willing to be that perfect picture of righteousness and peace, of mercy and truth. And it, Lord, not be distorted by our own feelings and our own desires to do it our way. Yes. But Lord, take away self-righteousness. Take away our views of how things should be or how it should work and give us a sight that only you can give us. Blind us to our own way, Lord, and open our eyes to your way. Give us, Lord, that assurance that you will go with us. Give us an assurance that you are with us and you are paving the way for us to show this true picture to those, Lord, who have never seen you. Thank you for your power to work in our lives this way. And I pray that each and every one of us will open up our hearts to be strong, to allow you to come in and show forth this perfect picture. We need it. This world needs it. Thank you for giving it to us, Lord. Thank you for your mercy and truth in our own lives, for your righteousness and peace that has been sh has shown up time that shows up time after time in our own lives. Thank you so much, Lord, for what you will do for us and for the opening of our eyes. Help us to believe in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Grace and peace. This is Brother Chris, and we hope that you were blessed and encouraged by the message you just experienced. If it touched you personally and you're ready to go in the next step in your walk with Jesus, please let us know. Leave a comment in the box below. Or if you're watching through YouTube or Facebook, just visit our ministry page under Change Ministry. But you may have been watching and you recognize, I want this in my church or we need this in our school. And if that's your desire, we'd love to help also. In fact, we believe so much in the power of God's love to change that we're willing to come where you are free of charge. Yes, we will come to your organization at no expense to you. All we need is your invitation.